Hello students, my name is Shreya. I teach English literature at Global Teachers Academy and today I'm going to discuss some of the most important questions that would be very important for you to handle the UGC net examination. Now these questions do not come from a particular portion, for instance a British literature, but are a comprehensive set of questions from British literature, world literature, literary criticism and theory, English language teaching and rhetorics, right? So all your important portions are covered through these questions. And a good way of always learning is by answering questions, right? So let's start with the first question. The first question says, who among the following characters in Thomas More's Utopia did not correspond in bi biographical account to an actual historic person, right? Your options here are A. Morton, B. Heitholde, C. Giles, D. Moore, right? A little bit about Thomas More's Utopia. The text was written in 1516 in Latin, right? It was translated in 1551 by a certain individual called Ralph Robinson in English. And the term utopian literature, right? As we understand it now about a text that talks about a land that is better than your actual land, better than your actual world, comes from the for the first time from Thomas More's text itself, right? So now the options. The first option is Morton. Morton was the actual chancellor to Henry VIII. So he becomes an actual historical person. Option B, Hytholde, who is not an actual historic figure. In the text, he's a philosopher and a world traveler and lives in this island of Utopia for five years. The name itself means it's a Greek word that means a talker of nonsense. So your option here, your answer here is B. But we should also always when we look at the question, especially for the UGC net exam, also look at the other options that are not the actual answer. OK, so C, for instance, Giles is, act, is an actual person whose full name is Peter Giles, who was Moore's friend, real life friend, right? And last person is Moore himself, who's the actual author. So Sir Thomas Moore is your fourth option, right? The answer becomes Haitholde because he's not an actual historic person and he's been described in the novel. But it's important for you in the process to also understand your options A, C and D and what roles are they playing in the text, okay? Next question. In Wuthering Heights, Kathy appears in a dream, beating at the window, wailing, let me in, blood running down her wrist. Who dreams her, right? So who was dreamt of Catherine? Who, who uh, Catherine appears in which person's dream, right? The options here are A. Lockwood, B. Nelly, C. Heathcliff, D. Edgar Linton, right? So these are your four options. Now, Wuthering Heights is a benchmark classic text in English literature. It was written by... Emily Bronte, one of the only texts that Emily Bronte has written, 1847 text. And another important question here to tackle is, what is the pseudonym under which Emily Bronte used to write? So the pseudonym is Ellie Bell. Correct? Now, so for instance, net, uh, net asks you a lot of time, a lot of detailed summaries. And Wuthering Heights is one text where you must look at the summary. So the text begins in the very beginning of the story itself. There is, an, there is a certain individual called Mr. Lockwood. He's a wealthy man from south of England. And he rents a place, right? Then he visits his landlord, who happens to be Mr. Heathcliff, who lives in a remote moorland farmhouse called the Wuthering Heights itself. And there is heavy snow. So uh, Lockwood cannot return back to the place that he's rented. And what he ends up doing is stays there for the night. And in the night, he happens to have a nightmare in which he sees Kathy. So your correct answer would be Lockwood. Next question comes from another important portion called the ELT, which is the English language teaching portion. Now, most of us, because we've not been, we've not been taught this section in our masters, we tend to ignore this, but this section generally forms a very important part of the paper. At least three to four questions come from this portion. And it's very easy to tackle this portion if we give it a little bit more time and effort. So the question says, which of the following second language learners would most likely acquire the second language more easily? Option A, a high school student who's been enrolled in mandatory classes in the second language since elementary school. 
Option B, a visitor to a country where the second language is spoken. He interacts with hotel and restaurant personnel using the second language. C, a business person for, for whom fluency in second language may lead to career advancement. And D, an immigrant living in a country where the second language is spoken. He feels accepted by the speakers of the second language. Right? So the fa primary factor that affects language learning is the input that the learner receives. Stephen Krashen. is an important language theorist who said he would take an important position here. He said it is important, the input that the learner receives is important. He asserts that the input is necessary for second language acquisition. So all the inputs that you're getting as the second language taker, the inputs become fundamental in, in sort of understanding if you'll be able to take in the language or not, right? So if it's an immigrant who's living in a language where and he feels accepted, right? If he feels in his mind that he's accepted in, if he acquires the second language, he would be the most likely to learn that language well, right? Versus somebody who's trying to do it for a career advancement or versus somebody who's just using a language as a tools of communication. There is a difference between language becoming, language being the tools of communication and language becoming the I, right? Here, for an immigrant who's accepted in the society, who makes language as a way of living, it becomes language as the individual. So language becomes not just a mode of communication, but a way of living. Moving on now to the fourth question. The fourth question says, Marvel's The Coronet seeks to explore the human conditions in terms of the conflict between. Your options here are A, body and soul, B, war and peace, C, nature and grace, and D, flesh and spirit, right? Now, before answering the question, let's move on to see a little bit more about the poet himself and the text that he's written. So the poet here is, as all of you must know, Andrew Marvel, 17th century poet, characterized as a metaphysical poet. Now, who are metaphysical poets? Important here again, important question to tackle here again is, who coined the terms metaphysical? So your critic, Samuel Johnson, coined the term metaphysical poets, right? Who are metaphysical poets? Metaphysical poets are poets whose work is characterized by the use of conceits. Andrew Marvel has written some very important poems. Some of his important poems include To His Coy Mistress, and another one is The Garden, right? Now coming on to this poem, which is known as The Coronet, the poem itself describes a struggle that the that the poet is suffering from to use his poetic talents either for God. Sh so should he use his poetic talents for God or should he use his poetic talents to gain fame, right? So it's a conflict between his nature, what he, what he should do as human and between divine grace. So your answer would be C here, right? Moving on to the next question. The next question says, again, the question features from ELT, English Language and Teaching portion. If you'll see the general amount of questions that we put from ELT, we've sort of focused on ELT also. And the reason why we focused on ELT is because it's an often ignored section, whereas very easy to tackle. The question says, which of the following statements best describes an example of the influence of an effective factor on second language acquisition? I would explain the question a little bit further. So it says, what is the most impact or important factor when somebody is trying to acquire a second language? Your options here are A, a second language learner makes educated guesses about word meanings in the text by recognizing cognates. B, a second language learner uses familiar vocabulary to mentally form sentences before speaking. C, an adult second language learner finds it impossible to form second language sounds that do not occur in his first language. And D, a second language learner employs several words from the first language when speaking the, sec when speaking the second language, speaking here, when speaking the second language, but not when writing it, right? So for a second language learner, you need to understand that acquisition of meaning, knowing the words is the most important task, right? 
So a second language learner often uses familiar vocabulary, the words that he's already aware of mentally and then forms the sentences mentally before actually speaking them out. So your answer here would be B. Moving on then to the next question. The question says a close friend of Dickens objected to the original ending of Great Expectations in which Estella remarries and Pip remains single. Dickens accordingly revisited to a Dickens accordingly revised it to a more conventional ending which suggests that Pip and Estella would marry right who was this friend okay so the question here talks of great expectations and also it's a trivia from literary history and as you know if you've seen the net examination there are a lot of trivias from literary history so they're not only focusing on say for instance the text but also about the relationship that various authors shared and how one author influenced the work of the other right here important again is the question so you need to know that the original ending of great expectations was what it was in which estella remarries and pip remains single right so you need to keep the original ending in mind so this is your first pointer from the, from from the question that must be kept in mind then what is the actual ending that he went ahead with which was a more conventional ending in which suggests pip and, pip, pip and estella marrying each other right so who was this friend? This friend was Wilkie Collins. Now this is this is not a question that you would know had you not read a little bit of tri trivia. And so I always tell my students whenever they're trying to look at a text, start by just basic Google searching that text. And all these things that come across are usually the ones that appear in the first page, right? And you must go through those things in order to tackle most questions that the exams that, that the exam asks you to. Right, uh, Wilkie Collins, a little bit about him. He's supposed to be the inventor of a novel form called sensation, sensational novel. Right, he's written a lot of novels, a lot of plays, more than a hundred non fiction pieces, but we not as important as somebody, say, a Charles Dickens is. Next question In the very opening scene of Walpone, the protagonist says, Open the shrine that I may see my saint, right? By the word saint, Walpole is referring to. Walpole again, a text by Ben Johnson, right? A 1606 text. Ben Johnson, very important playwright, often pitched against Shakespeare. One author who followed the Aristotelian unities to the T, right? And so he's always constantly pitched against Shakespeare. Samuel Johnson in his preface to Shakespeare talks about Ben Johnson in contrast to Shakespeare. So very important play, right? In terms of the work that you have to see, in terms of the detailed summaries that you have to see. So you have to see the detailed summary for say the alchemist, the Walpole and some, of, some more of his plays, right? So here the question, Walpole says... Uh, saint about gold. Little bit more, little bit more explanation. So Walpole is a, is a very shrewd man. He's uh, he's talking here to his servant Mosca and says that. So the entire line is "Good morning to the day and next my gold. Open the shrine that I may see my saint." So the saint gold is compared to a saint. So gold becomes his spiritual master. So the statement very well highlights the greed of this character. Within one character, and that is the genius of playwrights like Shakespeare and Ben Johnson, within one line, within one opening statement that a person is making, where he's equating gold to be his spiritual master, he's created a very, gr a very grim picture of somebody who's very greedy, right? So gold is your answer here. And moving on. So even if you knew that Walpole is a character who's very greedy, you could have sort of associated the idea of saint to something that's more materialistic. So for instance, something that, something like gold. Moving on. The next question is, all except one of the following scholars have come up with models which aim to characterize the world Englishes within one conceptual set. Identify the lone exception, right? Now, uh, all, all these people that are given in the options, Tom MacArthur A, B, Naomi Chomsky, C, Braj Kachru, D, Manfred Gorlack. All these people here are important linguists. But the most important linguist that we must discuss and you must know about is Naomi Chomsky, right? Now, all these people have said that they say that 
there is a different underlying linguistic structure that is dependent on socio economic and cultural differences in people whereas nayon chomsky is the only one who says that there is for all humans the same underlying linguistic structure irrespective of the socio cultural differences and that is what the question asks you right let's now look at the ninth question the question starts with a quote it says cover her face my eyes dazzle she died young she and i were twins and should i die this instant i'd lived her time to a minute right in the light of the above quotation which of the following interpretations is not correct right the net exam the ugc net exam often tends to play with the word not or which of these is the odd one out and what one often tends to do is not read the question properly and not answer according to the question the options here are a the beauty and youth of the duchess become obvious to ferdinand when he sees her dead body b only when he identifies himself with her does he realize the enormity of his crime c when he compares the age of the duchess which is with his own and puts himself in a position does he realize his guilt d he wants her face to be covered because it reminds him of her infidelity the text here is the duchess of malfi by john webster written in 1612 right the play is a tragic play is known for one of the most brutal villains of all times that this is again a net question basola right the most villainous figure in all literary history here here what has happened is the the brother the twin brother of the duchess had ordered for her to be killed and so uh, the duchess uh, was uh, strangled but the duchess was very she was very calm while she was being strangled because there was an awareness that her family is already dead and through her death she is going to finally meet her family members now here after she is dead is when a uh, ferdinand goes to basola and says that you he she, she basola shouldn't have followed his orders and it is this time where he actually realizes his guilt where he actually sees that he did wrong and that he was very perturbed when he understood that she's married somebody else and the fortune that could have belonged to him now would pass on to the duchess husband right so all these things had really instigated ferdinand but when he sees her dead is when he realizes his guilt he he also wants to cover her face because it again reminds her him of her infidelity and only when she he finally sees the dead body he sees the enormity of his crime so all b c and d are correct whereas a is not correct it's not the beauty and youth that become obvious to ferdinand right here again about webster a little bit you have to do the duchess of malfi as well as the other text the white devil in detail moving on to the next question the inferior princess at her altar side trembling begins the sacred rites of pride it's again a quote right a lot of quotes again in the paper and so we've tried to stick to that pattern and put the questions that have quotes in this description of belinda at the dressing table what does the word pride refer to a vanity b pride as the first of man's sin man's sins c both a and b d complacency now where is this quote from knowing the character only you would know that the quote is from the rape of lock it's an epic poem mock heroic poem mock epic poem by alexander pope now here alexander pope has used elements of an epic and he has tried to trivialize it right so when he talks of her dressing table when he talks of belinda's dressing table there is the obvious vanity that he is talking about but he is also constantly referring to the pri- referring to pride as man's first sins because that is the character of a mock epic right you have to take grand metaphors in order to describe things trivial so belinda's obsession with her beauty is a trivial matter whereas man's first sin is not a, is not as trivial a matter it's a mock matter it's a matter that has resulted in the original sin right but the mock epic the mock epic tends to bring these two together and create a 
harmony between the elements that are mock uh, the elements that are epic and use them in a trivial fashion so that it becomes mock epic so your answer here would be c moving on to the next question what characteristics of 17th century metaphysical poetry sparked the enthusiasm of modernist poets and critics now here it talk it is talking about metaphysical poetry like already mentioned in the previous question the word metaphysical was first time given to us by samuel johnson right who used this term for the first time it was used as a term to describe uh, poets who were using far fetched metaphorical conceits now what are these metaphorical conceits these are metaphors in which two things are compared but two things so your metaphors are generally the things that are compared to each other are generally have some relationship but in case of metaphorical conceits the the relationship that the uh, the two shared the comparison as well as the object with which it was compared were very far fetched right so an example would be from one of his poems where the lovers are compared to two ends of a compass right not a very usual metaphor to take but that is what uh, dun had done with one of his poems right so the options here are the code here is one is its intellectual complexity two its uncompromising engagement with politics three its religious fervor four its union of thought and wit the right combination according to the code is a 1 and 3 are correct b 1 and 4 are correct c 2 and 3 are correct d so like i told you metaphorical conceits about using a lot of scientific things together to combine it with objects that were unknown of then there was also the thought that went behind there was also a large amount of wit that was involved so the option would be 1 and 4 which is intellectual complexity and its union of thought and wit right so your option would be option b moving on to the next question count no man happy until he dies free of pain at last is the last line of your options here are a oedipus at colonus b agamemnon c oedipus the king d orestes right now oedipus the king is an athenian tragedy by sophocles you need to when you look at world literature when you try and tackle world literature it's important for you to look at ancient greek te texts also they are important oedipus rex was uh, a question in the last net there there have always been questions from horace there have always uh, another question was from ars poetica so all these texts along with the poems you have to keep in mind when you're doing world literature okay so sophocles text oedipus rex or oedipus the king was first time performed in 490 429 bc and it's about it's a story of oedipus a man who becomes the king of thebes who was destined from birth to murder his father laius and marry his mother jacasta right so now the this line this is the last line of who this is the last line of oedipus the king where he says count no man happy un until he dies free of pain at last very important line one of the very popular last lines in literature moving on to the next question which of the following features are present in dostoevsky's crime and Punish punishment right crime and punishment is a 1866 text so what are the features that are present the options are nihilism b utilitarianism 3 rationalism 4 christian symbolism the correct combination according to the uh, code is a 1 and 2 are correct so nihilism and utilitarianism b 1 and 4 are correct so nihilism and christian symbol symbolism c 3 and 4 are correct so rationalism and christian symbolism d 1 and 3 are correct so nihilism and rationalism right here it's important the author is important who is the author fedor dostoevsky fedor dostoevsky has written crime and punishment in 1866 now when you look at world literature and you start looking at russian literature crime and punishment is a text that you must look at it in detail right so in this text dostoevsky has in this text or in general the things that he has written he is constantly pointed out the problems that can occur with utilitarianism and rationalism but these are not things that are dealt in crime and punishment 
In crime and punishment, he deals in particularly with nihilism and Christian symbolism. For Christian symbolism, uh, he generally focuses a lot on reason and suppressing entirely Christian pity and compassion because he feels rationalism is more important, right? So your answer here would be 1 and 4 and 1 and 4 are correct. In E.M. Foster's A Passage to India, some of the major symbols are associated with 1. Mountain B. 2. Tiger 3. Echoes 4. Clouds The right combination according to the code is A. 1 and 2 are correct. So, mountains and tiger. B. 1, 2 and 4 are correct. So, mountain, tigers and clouds. C. 1 and 3 are correct. So, mountains and echoes. D. 2 and 4 are correct. So, tigers and clouds. Right? Again, a text where summary is very important. A 1924 text by E.M. Foster. The immediate context of the text is, is placed against the backdrop of British Raj and the Indian independence movement in what time? 1920s, right? So there is also uh, the conflict between the British and the Indians not in terms of uh, the actual freedom struggle but more so in terms of the cultural differences that occur between say a uh, Indian who's, uh, who's under a colony and a British person who's coming from England, right? What are some of the important symbols that are used? The important symbols are mountains and echoes. You must do the summary and if you do the summary, these are the very evident two symbols that are constantly moving around in the text. The name of the mountains that are mentioned in the text are Marabar Caves, which is an attribution of Barabar Caves, which are in Bihar. Right? So, mountain in the novel is a space that is presented, which is, which is very alien. The alien in the nature. The one that no human can capture. The one that defies both English and Indian. Right? The one that is beyond control of people who are exercising control in India. Right? So, as a symbol of nature that is beyond control of all men. So, mountain is an important symbol here. Second, echo. So, the, uh, the echo begins at the Marabar Caves and this is the first echo which uh, by through which, by which Mrs. Moore and Adela hear the echo and are haunted by it for the longest time, right? So, your correct option would be 1 and 3, which is soon is God or cousin. There is no crop other than God and God is harvested here around the ear. So, the question asks you, where is this extract from? Is it from Jayan Mahapatra's Konarak? Is it from Arun Kolatkar's Dejuri? Is it from Pila's being very simple God? Or is it from R. Partha Sarathi's under another sky? Right? This question now you could only tackle if you know these poems. Right? And you must, for all these four authors, these are very important in Indian history, Indian literature. And you must know all of these very well. Right? The question, the answer here is B. Arun Kolatkar's Dejuri. And the name of the poem is a scratch, right? Uh, Arun Kolatkar, very important poet. He's a poet from Maharashtra. He writes in both Marathi and English. And his first book of English poetry was Jejuri, right? Very important compilation, contains 31 poems, right? And uh, so again, this poem again is from a poem called Scratch, a scratch, Right? Your answer here is Arun Kolatkar. Moving on to the next question. Match the following list. List 1, which is a list of novels. So the list of novel is The Power and the Glory. B. The Quiet American. 3. The Honorary Consul. 4. The Comedians. List 2 is the setting. So the first place, the first place of setting is Vietnam. Second is Haiti. 3 is Paraguay. And 4th is Mexico. So, you have to find the right combination. Now, again, this is, these are all books written by Graham Greene. For most of his books, even if you don't do the detailed summary, a general understanding of what he writes about is important, right? Graham Greene is a poet who explores a lot of moral and political issues of the world in his novels. But all are done through a Catholic perspective. Right? A little bit about each of these novels. The Power and the Glory, the first one, written in 1940, right, is a novel which tells the story of a Roman Catholic priest in the state of uh, Tobasco, which is in Mexico. 
so your first for the first one the power and glory is set in mexico right so the first is 4 right so the only options here are these two okay and uh, very important here is you might not know the setting of all these four right so it's important to understand which ones are not going to be answered so for instance if you understand this and maybe you know one of these you might be able to tackle the question well because you've already crossed out b and d even if you don't know the other three then also your chances of getting the right answer are 50 percent here right versus there being 25% chances for you to answer the question. For every competitive exam which is objective type, playing smart is also a game you must learn, right? So the second question, uh, the second option is the quiet American. The quiet American uh, covers the French war in Vietnam. So for your second one, the answer becomes Vietnam, which is one. So now even if you don't move on to do the other options, even if you don't know the other options, you're, you already know that the answer here is A. But let us see the other novels. Uh, the Quiet American was written in 1955. Uh, there was also a Graham Greene question where you had to arrange the novels according to chronology. So you must keep the years in mind. Third is the Honorary Consul, which is a thriller novel which is set in Paraguay, which is the three option. The fourth one, The Comedians, is again set, uh, without a doubt, is set in Haiti. And it's about a, it's a story of a tired hotel owner who eventually falls into barbarianism. Okay, so your answer to the question is A, The Comedians was written in 1966. So you also have a, and The Honorary Consul was written in 1973. So you also have a chronological order of Graham, Ge Graham Greene's important novels, right? The next question says the term ecological imperialism was coined by, right? Alfred Crosby, which is your fourth option. I'll read out the other options also. So your A option is Vandana Shiva, B is Lawrence Buell, C is Paulo Freire, and D is Alfred Crosby. So Alfred Crosby, like I already told you, is the correct answer because Alfred Crosby has written a book of the same name called The Ecological Imperialism, The Biological Expansion of Europe, 1900 to 1900. 900 to 1900, right? It's a 1986 book of the same name, right? It's a very interesting text because it's something he is propounding a theory that has yet been unknown. Now, what is the theory? He says Europe's colonialization. So Europe's attempt to colonize the world was more a result of biology than of military conquest. Something that nobody had ever said, right? What does he mean essentially? He says settlers accidentally or deliberately introduced a lot of plants and animals in the land that they were coming to. So in the colonized land, they introduced a lot of plants and animals, which eventually led to major shifts in climate, right? Which the colonizers used to their advantage, right? Very interesting text. If you ever have time, you must go through it. So your answer is Alfred Crosby. Here again, Vandana Shiva is, a, is an important eco-feminist. So some of the texts that she's written, you can also go through, right? Now, the last question for these set of questions, the important questions that we've created for you, curated for you, is the system of social rules that a speaker knows about language and uses is called a. Grammar, B. Morphology, C. Orthography, or D. Pragmatics, right? A set of, a, a system of social rules and not grammatical rules, right? Had it been grammatical rules, the answer would have been grammar. But it's about social rules. So the answer here is going to be pragmatics. Now what is pragmatics? Pragmatics is the study of aspects of meaning and language use that are dependent upon the speaker, the addressee and other features of the context of the utterance, right? So one for instance, if I'm speaking to you and taking a lecture, there are, there are going to be the, there are going to be words that I use that I use for a formal setup, right? Then when I'm with my set of friends, I might use the set of words that would be for an informal setup. So every time a speaker speaks, there is always the context, there are always the addressee and there are always the speaker's intent and motive that one must keep in mind. And the study of all these is called pragmatics. Another similar theory is a speech act theory. 
important propounder is J.L. Austin, who also talk of words as performance. So each word when uttered is uttered keeping the audience, the speaker, the context and the setting in mind, right? So with these, we finish the most important questions that could be expected to come in the examination, the most important question that would give you insights upon important authors and their works and the kind of question that would further enhance your studies. So thank you for watching. Have a good day.